Shit. Welcome to a boss cog. I'll be doing a few series of Cogwatch's deep dives into game mechanics, but I want to end each one with a boss cog. A superb mechanic that this time I'm not able to explain. It's satisfying to dissect a game and see what makes it tick, but to stop there would be doing a disservice to an emotive, artistic medium. I reckon we can learn even more by gazing into the abyss of systems we cannot yet fathom. So, Sunless Sea is a captivating game of captaining a ship in a surreal underworld. It's one part roguelike as you plot voyages, hire crew and make money, and one part breathtaking, heartbreaking and frequently sickening text adventure. Sunless Sea is a collaborative effort from the very best writers in the business, from 80 Days' Meg Giant to Galatea's Emily Short, even Rock Paper Shotgun's own Richard Cobbett, and whenever you weigh anchor you're arriving at someone's untamed imagination. It's also the recipient of Eurogamer's last ever 10 out of 10 before they junked scores. But it's a mess. This is a story-driven RPG with multiple novels worth of content with permadeath as its default mode, necessitating that you repeat storylines again and again. You can change your origin story and pick different paths depending on your stats, but you're also probably playing your first character's child, which raises the question of why exactly the same adventures are happening to them? Much more importantly, Sunless Sea is a mediocre roguelike. This isn't Fail Better's wheelhouse, and it shows in the clunky interface, awkward combat, but most of all, in these interminable journeys between islands. This indecision as to whether Sunless Sea is a roguelike or RPG is the source of nearly everything that's wrong with it. Not my words, that's what Fail Better director Alexis Kennedy said in his post-mortem. Damning. And yet. In venturing so far, off the beaten track of game design, Sunless Sea found something. Tangent, I'm probably best known on RPS for my screed on Pathologic, a surrealist Russian RPG about a plague devouring a small town. It's kind of System Shock meets Franz Kafka, if we're being charitable, and it was 15 years ahead of its time. A remake was kickstarted late last year, which is great news, but what's relevant to us today is what I've always said about Pathologic. How it's vile texture work, repetitive industrial soundtrack, and desperately unfair quest structure played into its theme of sickness. The games press would universally call Pathologic a bad game. It made you feel exhausted, unwell, betrayed. But I think a more mature press might have tried to unpick these feelings from the game's artistic intent. Another example of games exploring uncomfortable territory is, of course, the earliest Silent Hills. These are relentlessly horrid games. They're uncomfortable designs without even the brief moments of empowerment offered by Resident Evil. The Silent Hill games chased tonality and a sense of place to the point of alienating millions of potential customers, but in doing so created one of the most consistent artistic visions of that generation. Silent Hill 2 is something that we continue to infuse about 10 years on. Back to Sunless Sea, an astonishing text adventure lashed Odysseus-like to a plodding roguelike, something even the lead designer calls a mistake. And yet, it makes the game magical. I use the word magical there because Sunless Sea is pursuing something more nebulous than frustration or horror. It's a game with the stated goal of fostering a sense of loneliness and an unease at the deep sea, an awe at strange new lands. To the whiteboard! Okay. Let's say you're playing Sunless Sea and you have a sweetheart waiting for you back at home in London. And you're on your boat, I've lost my lid, and an officer approaches you saying, do you want to have, to have a private moment in my cabin? I love you. But you, you know, your sweetheart back home is pregnant and you do love her, so do you cheat on her? Well, probably not, right? And that's not much of an interesting decision, but what if? Because this is the case in Sunless Sea, you're on a journey and this officer is the only interesting thing for miles around. And it's going to take 10 minutes to get home. It's 10 minutes of waiting and you're bored. Do you make that decision? What if, let's make it even more interesting, you're not heading back, but you're heading out. And you're not going to see your sweetheart for hours, right? What if your ship is running out of supplies? and you think this character is going to die as the crew is reduced to cannibalism in the middle of a dark sea, and you will never see your sweetheart again, then do you sleep with the officer, who maybe you do like a bit? 
You see, all this is really doing with its game is letting you empathise with your character. Sunless Sea chose in its development to truck in the negative emotions of loneliness and unease and fear, and turns out a boring game that will kill you, if, you know, that, it, that lets you play into those themes and think in, in the same way that your character would. And let me put this another way, okay? Here are two charts. This is kind of the, let's, let's rate the experience of playing the game on this, on this axis and then time. So if Sunless Sea had a better roguelike, it would have these moments of kind of like joy and development and then you get to a tax adventure and that's even better and then, and then joy and then tax adventure. Sunless Sea, in having a really boring, te you know, uh, roguelike, all you can do in those moments is anticipate story and be excited by it. And actually, story spikes really high at this point, and then goes all the way down and then spikes really high. And if you don't believe me, then talk to people who've played Sunless Sea and have turned off the permadeath after 20 hours, or have finally got the very best engine and just zip between islands. And so those journeys suddenly don't seem like anything, because the game loses something. And, you know, okay, an example to prove this to you. Let's say permadeath is on, and the game says, do you want to go and kill the Spider Queen? And you have no idea what the consequences for this voyage will be. You're nervous, and making that decision means something. Whereas if you have a save game, going off to kill the Spider Queen is irrelevant. This is a hugely interesting sort of um, relationship that these two genres have when you put them together. And you know what, I was thinking about this, this fact that in making a game better, Sunless Sea would lose something else, and it does have a precedent in one of the most popular genres of games in the world. It's Japanese RPGs, which have something in common with Sunless Sea. Plot and set pieces that you play the game for, with miles of padding in between. And we see the same effect here. Plot twists are made hugely exciting purely because the player has to work for them. And also, the slog of the game proper helps us to identify with the themes of the story. Hardship, long journeys, growing as individuals. Does this grind make JRPGs better video games? I think the collective answer would be no. But would they lose their grandeur if you took the grind away? Yes. Do we understand why? Not really. We've never had a dialogue around this, and decades of games being sold based on review scores means we've never encouraged developers to experiment with quote-unquote bad games. We only see it in the stubborn genre of JRPGs and in Sunless Sea, where the lead dev practically apologises for it. We have to start taking a look at these negative experiences ultimately enriching the game. For what it's worth, in Simon Parkin's place, I like to think I also would have given Sunless Sea a 10 out of 10, but only because of the highs it took me to. Of moments I thought I was lost and found my way home. Of the terrible things I did because the button was there. And I would never have reached those places if the entire game was engaging.